Ladies and gentlemen, before we proceed with the next speaker, there is an announcement. All the slide presentations have been provided in the CD. It is also available in our website www.cream.com.my www.cream.com.my which can be downloaded starting this Monday. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, now it is my pleasure to introduce the next speaker. Dr. Badrul bin Ahmad, who is the Chief Technology Officer of TNB Research Sindhya Berhad. Before that, please allow me to give a brief introduction about him. Dr. Badrul has more than 25 years of experience in the industry. His expertise includes power plants, gas turbine, life assessment, plant operations and maintenance. Currently, he is the Chief Technology Officer of TNB Research Sindhya Berhad where he plays a leading role in the development of materials engineering in power plant life management. Without further ado, please welcome Dr. Badrul Ahmad. Increasing, 
but we don't expect that green energy to be the major portion of the uh, energy mix uh, in, uh, until 2030, etc. Then there is a need of, for us to make use of uh, uh, the primary energy source efficiently, secondly also to make uh, efficient use of the secondary energy like electricity. So we can't go on the, uh, using electricity as we do now, but we have to find ways and means to, to make sure that the use of electricity will be reduced over time. Then the next thing to do is to increase the penetration of RE energy. And there are a lot of barriers uh, that need to be overcome, and this has been the, the addressed at the government level and by other uh, by, by various people as well, including the uh, building community. But then the, we talk about alternative energy deployment. Uh, this may include uh, nuclear energy, and uh, this requires a lot of uh, the effort to make sure that the technology that we are going to adopt uh, will be safe for the society. And uh, we need also to uh, make sure that public can accept this new form of uh, energy source. So when we talk about uh, early technology deployment, uh, there are a number of issues that we need to understand. Uh, this, uh, the, the first thing is that we need to recognize the fact that we have to consider the entire life cycle of uh, this technology uh, uh, deployment. So this uh, life cycle that I uh, uh, show that uh, is not limited to uh, RE technology, but it is applicable to all technologies. Whether you buy a gas turbine, you build a power station, refineries, this uh, life cycle uh, consideration is an important part of the whole uh, the uh, asset uh, acquisition uh, issues. And issues uh, related to this economics, there, there are other issues, especially for technologies we are, we are, uh, which, uh, which are new. And uh, technology itself need to be uh, understood properly. So what we want to avoid is to be the servant to technology. What we want to do is to make technology uh, uh, to serve the society. Then human capital, which is uh, uh, competencies, things like that. In many cases, uh, when we are confronted with new technologies, we just acquire the technologies, then we start, uh, then a few years down the road, we start having problems with technologies. And many of these technologies, projects, uh, end up as one elephant. So that is exactly what we want to avoid, and uh, that is what uh, that, that is the, uh, very much better to the sustainability. So how the MB is uh, playing the role uh, to, to, to 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 uh, provide solution to all the issues that I've raised uh, uh, earlier. And uh, at the MBR research, at the R&D level, we have uh, started in the last few years to, uh, on a new research direction, we call this one uh, advanced research program. Advanced research program here is just to uh, differentiate from what we have been doing in the past. In the past, we've been looking at uh, the operational problem and try to find solution uh, to those uh, problems. This area of uh, uh, research will be focusing more on new technologies which may not be uh, available yet in TNB, but we are trying to prepare ourselves in terms of uh, developing capability, uh, competencies, and etc. So we have uh, uh, four areas, main areas of our uh, technology. We've got the green energy technology, and smart grid technology, low carbon power generation technology, emission and waste management technology. So under the green energy technology, we have lined up a number of projects. Some of these have been uh, completed and more are coming. So the solar technology application, uh, as you all know, they uh, include uh, electricity uh, using the PV technology, uh, CSP technology, concentrating solar power. Uh, 
uh, heating for cooling and for the lighting as well. So, again, talking about the technical sensibility, there is a need for us to understand what it's all about. The first thing is understanding local resource, uh, local or solar resource. What are the nature of the resource that we have? If you are talking about uh, electricity generation, then uh, you should understand the intermittent nature of that uh, uh, the resource. Then how we deal with that intermittency problem. So we need to know how much energy is available. People are saying Malaysia is blessed with uh, sunshine all year round. But uh, if you look at the studies here, yeah, we don't feel that it's always the case because Russia is blessed with clouds as well. Uh, so those phenomena uh, will uh, bring a specific problem to specific applications of the solar radiation. Then technology development and selection. Again, there have been a lot of technology being developed and how we select that technology to match whatever resource that we have. If you buy expensive, for example, uh, PV panels, and that PV panel is put in, for example, in Taipei, where we normally record very high rainfalls, yeah? uh, then that PV panel may not give you the best uh, output, and you may not get uh, value for money for that particular uh, technology. Then technology performance monitoring assessment. So this is an area that we are very much uh, lacking in. Uh, we build something, we put up something, then 10 years down the road, then we start having problems. Things are not delivering the, 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 the performance that we expect uh, it to be. Uh, things start breaking down. So it's very important that uh, when we uh, put uh, something uh, we monitor the performance and we have to take a proper action to make sure that performance it continue to be achieved throughout the life cycle of the product. Then again, the system integration, so is very much relevant to electricity network, very much relevant to other things as well. So let's look at the radiation basics. Uh, what we have in terms of the uh, uh, solar energy, we got the extraterrestrial radiation that's coming from the sun, and as it passes through the uh, uh, atmosphere, then it interacts with all sorts of matters that, uh, that we have in the atmosphere. What we have in the atmosphere, we got clouds there, we got the uh, moisture, we had the gases, we had particulate matters, all these interact with the solar radiation, and to give you various kind of radiation that we are going that we receive on the earth surface and this has great implication on the selection of the uh, of the technology that is suitable for a particular uh, locations so this is to show you that the energy uh, of from solar radiation they are not the same in all places they vary uh, from place to place and in the case of financial in Malaysia, we find that uh, the region with the highest solar radiation are located on the north uh, east and the northwest of financial in Malaysia. And again, it varies uh, over uh, seasonally. That is well known fact, and it's, uh, it's, uh, we see this uh, uh, trend, trend pattern all over the world. So this is the, the thing that we've been doing. Uh, we're trying to understand this resource uh, that we, uh, from the various location. Uh, here, what I'm going to emphasize here is basically the, uh, the source of resource data. So we need resource data to do a lot of things. For sizing of battery, for example. For uh, predicting what loads need to be to be supplied for the next three or four hours. So, in order for us to, uh, to, 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 to find out what, where are the sources of the erosion data, we undertake all this uh, work uh, and the research. First, we did the measurement. Uh, we got a set of uh, equipment there. And uh, we compared with the data that are available uh, from internet freely, and we also uh, look at the data provided by the uh, uh, 
by the Med Department of Malaysia. And for the, we recognize that uh, data for Peninsular Malaysia, they are quite limited, limited in the sense of uh, they are measured at only, uh, I think, 30 locations. And most of the data were meant for purposes other than solar uh, energy use. Yeah, probably more for the agriculture when they were set up is the uh, weather station and for weather forecasting. But uh, recently, there's a lot of interest uh, to, to get that data for uh, PV application. But those data are not uh, comprehensive enough to enable us to understand uh, what we have and what technology to use. Yeah. So we find here, uh, for example, uh, there's a big uh, difference between uh, those three sources of data there. The reason being, one, the main data, but we, we take, for example, the pool of Prentian. We took uh, uh, some uh, re uh, radiation data there, pool of Prentian. Then uh, the nearest uh, weather station uh, is in Kota Baru. And then we have the main data, which is heavily uh, available, easily available from the internet. And these are basically an average of over 20 years or so. So we find there are so many, uh, there's a big for the uh, divergence in the data that we get. And there are cases where the, uh, the, the, the data compares favorably. So that probably when we, the, when, when the, during the clear sky day. But I think all this uh, will be relevant, uh, for example, for building industry when you are selecting particular solar panel uh, technology that uh, make use of the solarization. We need all this data and we need to know where the data uh, should come from. So this is a typical uh, data that we have uh, when we measure over uh, for a day. And uh, solar radiation, uh, we know it consists of uh, two main components. Uh, one is the direct solar radiation. Uh, th that means the radiation that comes direct from the sun. Uh, they are not, uh, uh, they don't interact with matters that much and they fall on the Earth's surface. The other one, they fall on the Earth's surface after it has uh, 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 interacted with various matter. So one we call uh, direct radiation, one we call diffuse radiation. So again, the technology, they are Responds differently uh, to each of these kind of radiation. So this is uh, what uh, we have uh, in the case of clear sky, and uh, we have, for example, uh, the dark radiation is much higher. The one in blue much higher than the diffuse radiation. Likewise, in uh, partially cloudy day, we tend to have diffuse radiation much more than the direct radiation. So these are important if you want to optimize the deployment of any particular technology. And at the moment, this kind of data is not available for project developers. And uh, I think it's uh, good for, example, for the research community to undertake this kind of job so that we can uh, be uh, the 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 the, the, the uh, industry can benefit from this uh, kind of data. So, if you talk about technology uh, selection, as I mentioned earlier, a variety of technologies are available. They vary the cost of farmers and maturity. So, what we need to do now is to, 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 to optimize the uh, this uh, selection of technology. So we need to consider what technology needs to be uh, to be to be used. The nature, the resource, and uh, the, the, obviously the economics and other things. So as I mentioned again, uh, this process is often hampered by lack of the data. So this is uh, what we do. Uh, another thing that we do at uh, the research, we are comparing the performance of our technologies. So here. What we do, we look at uh, four different technologies, just an example uh, to illustrate, uh, to give a flavor of what we do at the research. And first we have the monocrystalline uh, 
PV system, uh, PV panel. Then we got the uh, crystalline, uh, morphous, and HIT. This is the uh, multi junction uh, and more advanced kind of uh, PV system. So we can see here, each of the PV system, they, 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 they perform differently. So here we are looking just at clear sky condition. If you do for the, if you do this study on cloudy day, so we have different performance patterns for each of these technology. So again, there is a need for us to understand all this for us to uh, maximize the investment in any particular technology. Now a bit about the uh, the kind of weather that we have in Malaysia. So we have done this uh, study. Uh, so June, from June uh, 2011 to May 2012, roughly one year period. So we try to categorize what sort of a uh, uh, condition we have in uh, Bangi here. This is for Bangi uh, location, that we research. I think the, I'm not sure whether the street does similar thing or not. So the, uh, we categorize the day into cloudy, partially cloudy and clear day, uh, three, three categories here. Then uh, we are looking at the clearness, clearness index. Based on the clearness index, we can say that a lot of the uh, uh, big portion of our, our, our uh, the big fraction of this cut, the, 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 the year, uh, the number of days in the year falls under the uh, cloudy, uh, partially cloudy days. So that is uh, in uh, Bangi. If you do that uh, in, say, Kota uh, Baru, uh, we'll find different kind of distribution there. And probably the Kota Baru, the technology that you require to, to harness the solar energy may be different from what we have in Bangi. So another thing that we do is that this is not the main, uh, the main, uh, uh, function job of the data research, but uh, what we intend to do here is to, 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 to develop this solar house, the existing solar house, into a uh, green building. Uh, hopefully, we want it to be certified. And so this building uh, consists of uh, the aircon area and non-aircon area. The aircon area is about 192 square, uh, square meters and uh, it consists of uh, many windows, concrete roof tiles, and plaster brick walls. It is partially shaded by the main KMBR building and partially shaded by the building, uh, uh, things like the, uh, the, the bank uh, and also the research center on the other side of the road. And uh, so in order for us to understand what are the hit gates, uh, for this building, we undertook this uh, uh, thermography and uh, we got this kind of uh, image uh, for this particular house. So we are not talking about new design here, we are talking about existing design which has been there for more than 10 years already. So clearly we can see here the, uh, the one that is the very hot is the roof and also the windows there. <coughs> So we need something. To, uh, we need to do something about it. The uh, roof, for example, uh, we 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 do further check, further study on the roof attic, and we find that that roof attic is is sort of the uh, uh, is energy storage, thermal storage for the whole building. And if you trace, monitor the temperature profile for the whole day in the attic area, we find that. Uh, Starting from 10 o'clock, uh, unfortunately I don't have the, uh, the profile here. The, uh, from 10 o'clock onwards, that roof uh, attic temperature start rising up above the ambient temperature, and it will remain there until uh, probably uh, early in the morning. Then start coming down. Then uh, just before, I think around 8 o'clock, uh, the 7 o'clock, 6 o'clock. Uh, that temperature start dropping below the ambient temperature. So, but there are a lot of heat being stored within that space, and obviously there's a lot of things that we need to do. One of the things that we found uh, when we looked further uh, uh, is that uh, the foundation of materials, what as we normally do, uh, I'm not an architect or building uh, uh, 
specialist, but we have the foil uh, uh, underneath the roof. Those foils have degraded. So for most of buildings, uh, I doubt whether we have ever uh, uh, looked into the aspect or not. Once we put there, then we see it's going to work forever. And in this case, I got a good picture of the micro, uh, the, the, the micro images of the degradation uh, of the uh, foil as well. Uh, the foil first, uh, they are covered by dust that uh, obviously that uh, uh, affected the performance of the foil and it's a heat barrier or it's a reflector. And uh, secondly, the aluminum foil that is uh, placed on the baking paper, they have degraded uh, <coughs> tremendously. So that needs to be uh, addressed. I don't think uh, people are addressing this issue so much as they for whole building. Then uh, we start looking at uh, in details. Uh, I, I just summarized what we have uh, found here. The total heat gain we got about uh, 70,000 uh, watt here. Uh, then a lot of heat coming from the roof, the windows, wall, etc. Then we try to figure out how can we reduce these heat gains. Yeah? So then uh, we look at the passive, the various methods of passive cooling. Then we said that passive cooling, uh, we, through passive cooling, we can reduce uh, 5,000 watt there. And the rest is the active cooling. So we start looking at the active cooling, ways of active cooling. We uh, uh, examine uh, several technologies. Uh, one technology, for example, desiccant cooling. We are not just uh, making this uh, house as green building, but also making all this as uh, research uh, facilities as well. So we look at the uh, desiccant cooling. Desiccant cooling, I think, the, is the, uh, it's quite promising technology in, uh, in Australia, in Western countries. But we, when we do the analysis, we find that that is not suitable for our environment. The reason being is that our environment is very, very humid. We've got about 60% uh, the humidity here. So because of that, this desiccant cooling is not suitable. Then we look at other technologies, and basically we zoom in one or two technologies that we think uh, will be useful for this particular climate. And we are also looking at this technology, the absorbent uh, chiller, uh, uh, to uh, to harness the, to, 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 to demonstrate its uh, performance uh, in the research, and eventually we will would like to use this technology, it, it is proven to be uh, beneficial to extract the heat from the power plant. In power plant, there are a lot of waste heat being thrown out. Yeah? Uh, then the, there is a potential for us to get this waste heat and uh, to, 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 to uh, together with technology, to generate uh, some uh, uh, cooling effect for space cooling, also for heat exchanger in the power plant. So we are hoping to move in that direction uh, under this particular project. And on the uh, solar cooling capacity, so for that particular technology that we looked at, so we uh, we we uh, got these results here. Uh, if you look at the uh, red uh, lines, uh, so that is for two days cycle, right? from uh, 8.30 to uh, 4.30, then one, uh, one day, the next day from 8.30 to uh, 4.30. So we can see the uh, cooling capacity that we can get from that particular technology using uh, the uh, 150 square meter uh, collector surface area. Then we look at the hourly heat load there. Then we find uh, during the uh, early part or middle part of the day, uh, we have excess capacity there. And towards the uh, evening, we have lesser capacity, cooling capacity. So now it's a matter of using the excess capacity, store it, and use it uh, for, the, uh, for, 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 for later of the day. 
So this is the uh, uh, what we plan to do, the solar house, after all this study. So we are putting up uh, Thomas Solar Collectors, and we have the solar chiller and humidifier. Then we have this thermal storage. Uh, uh, there will be solar ventilator and TV on top of the roof, and uh, some of the windows, the uh, overhangs, and we are also looking at the possibility of putting us tubes because us tubes, uh, the potential for us to bring down the temperature uh, one or two degrees uh, uh, using the solar tubes uh, uh, technology there. So very quickly, the uh, solar access center, we have developed the solar access center basically to support the uh, utility scale, large scale of solar farms. And as we go uh, along, we find that the technology, not the knowledge and uh, facility that we have can be used for other things as well. So, uh, so these are some of the uh, uh, facilities for measurement of solar radiation. We got thermometer, the spirometer, the dust monitoring station, uh, weather station, and uh, a few, uh, and other things as well. And these are the uh, the testing facility that we have. Uh, on the left is the uh, uh, concentrator uh, test rig. So here what we're trying to do is to see whether we can uh, uh, get some uh, uh, concentrate some of the solar radiation uh, to improve the flat panel uh, uh, PV performance. And initial findings, results of God, shows it is quite promising there. And the recent activities that we have at the moment uh, are those uh, resource characterization application, uh, performance assessment of the technology, uh, optimization, uh, PV system operation maintenance, and solar thermal cooling. With that, uh, thank you very much for your attention.